All right, all right, all right. This is Matt. And Jake. Welcome to Sabbath Lounge. We are glad you are here. So today, Jake, um, we're going to be talking about something quite interesting, something that you may have never given much thought. Uh, Jake, what are we doing? We're going to talk about how Yahweh keeps the Torah. All right. That's uh, really a concept I hadn't thought much about, but uh, it, it makes sense. So, right. So there's no doubt uh, we know that he does keep Torah, but we do appreciate that you took a minute and you found us, and we ask that you'd spread the word. Jake, what can they do? Go to sabbathlounge.com and check out all the tabs there. You can find Torah portions and things like that, but... What we really want you to do is subscribe and share and like and do all those things that help the algorithm so this word can get out to other people that want to find us. And we've been getting some great comments, especially in our YouTube. We appreciate that, and we try to respond to all those. We apologize if we miss one. And Jake, tell them about some new place, some new thing they can do to hear us 24-7. Yeah, now you can check out kmsr1700am.com, uh, and that will be playing our content and much more content that's Torah-related. So check those guys out. And uh, uh, also, you can check out our interview with them in a previous episode. Yep, that's right. So, um, well, we're glad you're here, and we're going to take a look at how Yah keeps Torah. So we'll just jump right into uh, how Yah keeps Torah. So, Torah is for us versus Torah is for Yahweh. Right. So this kind of comes off of a concept of um, the way that Torah is laid out is how, how it's describing the character of Yah. So if it's describing the character of Yahweh, then he probably does those things, right? Yes, he does. Okay, so we're just going to go, we'll go quick through the topics we're going to hit, and then we'll spend some time on each one of these. But uh, So we'll jump into Curse of Bitter Waters, which if you've listened to for any length of time to this uh, this channel, then you've heard about that. Uh, so we'll share that. Uh, Abraham and Isaac test, uh, penalty for murder versus manslaughter. Uh, keeping vows, uh, the building of a tabernacle. Judging righteously, divorce rules, the Sabbath, the concept of a stranger can join the tribe, the don't be a respecter of persons, and just weights and measures. And by the way, we, Jake made us an outline here, so kind of giving you a, a preview about what we're, what we're about to do. Yep. Keeping it simple. All right, so this first one is the curse of the bitter waters. And what do you mean here, Jake? Us. So how are we kind of commanded in Torah? What is a Torah command that relates to the people? Not necessarily you and me. I mean, not some of these we're, we're unable to do, but um, uh, how, how does it relate to the people? And then we'll go and show how it relates to Yahweh doing it. So, okay. so we're going to show both uh, groups us and Yahweh doing doing these things. So, so you'll see us toggle between us and Yah. Right. So as you can see in the background, this nasty water, in Numbers 5, Yah commands to bring a cup of water with dirt in it, and the adulterous woman is to drink it. So, Matt, why don't you describe that real quick? Uh, because some people may not be familiar with that concept. Yeah, so if you've never seen this before, you know, this is not a good situation in a marriage. Uh, this is not uh, marriage success 101. This is uh, marriage is kind of uh, on the rocks at this <laughs> point. And uh, you bring your, your cheating wife up to the priest and you say, this woman's been cheating on me. And the priest is like, well, we'll find out. I've got just the thing. So, and he takes uh, some dirt off of the floor and uh, puts it in water and says, drink this, lady, and we'll see. We'll see who's been sinning and who hasn't been. <laughs> and uh, so if she's guilty, things happen in her body. And uh, so her thighs swell and abdomen drops, or some translations say like her uterus. And it sounds bad, 
whatever this was. It was not not a good thing. And if she's innocent, nothing happens to her. Right. So, but for the rest of his marriage, he had to hear, hey, you remember that time when you thought I was cheating? So, yeah, so, yeah there's right. that. So the, the abdomen, abdomen swells and the thigh rots. It sounds, sounds rough. Sounds like something I want to avoid. Yes. At all costs. So don't do that. All right. So now the flip of this, the curse of bitter waters for y'all. Okay. So one event that probably could have fit in the us category too, but, but we have another example here. So Moses crushes the golden calf to powder and he makes the people drink it in Exodus 32. So that's an example of that actually getting, uh, having more of a, uh, having more to it than just the us part. It's like, a you know, uh, more of a overarching mm -hmm. application than just for, for us. Yeah. And then in Matthew 27, Yeshua drinks the bitter water and suffers the curse. So how does he do this, Matt? Well, when he is on the cross, he basically takes on that cup of bitter waters because we are that adulterous woman. And so like the scenario before, we are that, that, and we are guilty and there is no hiding it. And we are, we, that should happen to us. Our thighs should rot and our abdomen should sweat. But, right. but really it's the, it's the penalty of death. And so when he, uh, when he prays, may this cup pass before me, I believe quite possibly he's talking about this cup of bitter waters. And uh, because he's taking on not just my sin, but your sin, the entire world's sin, which is pretty nasty. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's not, that's, but you know, that, that's, this is going to, I'm going to sidestep just a second. You, you know, we, when we, Often we talk about that and we talk about the entire world sin, but is it the entire world sin or is it only those that have chosen him, their sin? It's the opportunity yeah. for the whole world. But yes, your your sin is not paid for if you don't accept the the gift, right? Yeah, accept him as, as your savior. Right. And many deny him. But anyway. Yeah. So it's an interesting you, concept for sure. Yep. And so here in Matthew 27, you'll see they put the sponge up to his mouth and it's a bitter it's, vinegary wine, mm -hmm. kind of old nasty wine it thing. It literally is. A, it's not, not in a cup form. So, I mean, if you want to be technical, well, it wasn't a cup. It yeah. says it was a sponge. Now, could that be a translation thing? And could they have actually gotten a cup? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it changes it though. Yeah, I don't think it changes it. I think the point is he's... He's intaking some bitter fluid, and then uh, and there's his, a curse that goes along with it, and it's manifested in his body when he dies. Right, and when you think about uh, the abdomen swelling when you're um, when they poke him, mm -hmm. and uh, water well, it's and part, it's uh, a blood rush, runs out. Yeah, it's a result of crucifixion. Yeah, all of those fluids, you know, um, a symbol in the abdomen. Yeah, and uh, and makes him have this big old belly. Yeah, and then when you uh, for the thigh rotting, if you're if you understand how crucifixion works, you're you're holding yourself up so you can breathe with your feet, and then if you've ever done wall squats, you know exactly you can only do that for so long, and then you've had thighs rot away. Yes. <laughs> yep. So uh, on a very very small level. small scale, yeah. yeah. But. All right, the next thing, we've got Abraham, Isaac, us. Right. So how do, so yeah, the idea is how does Abraham the the story of Abraham and Isaac and what that represents and how does that apply to us? Well, the us part, Abraham being uh the us in this situation is, you know, set to offer his son and so as humanity, right? The us being humanity, right? So Abraham offers his son, uh, and he doesn't hesitate, and he goes right for it. And uh, Yah, as we know, provides the the ram in the thicket, and says, uh, you know, since essentially he's saying, since you were willing to offer your son, then uh, the whole world will be saved essentially from from your action there, and that's because of. We know that 
uh, the next part is going to talk about how what Yaw's part of this is. <laughs> so uh, here we have in, yes, in Genesis 22 was the Abraham Isaac offering. Uh, in this case, um, Yahweh offers his son, as we saw in Matthew 27. And that is the Yah Yahweh equivalent of Abraham offering his son. Since you offered your son, I it's an example of how I will offer my son. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the complete perfection of it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a foreshadowing right. and then the completed picture. And then we've got this concept of murder versus manslaughter. So the, the us part of it. So yeah, there's in Exodus 21, it talks about what the penalty is for murder and it's life for life, right? And then uh, it gives a different penalty for manslaughter, which is you have a city of refuge that you can, you know, hightail it to until the priest dies and then you, uh, then you're good to go. Yeah, and so, you know, manslaughter basically is an accident, you know, it could be. And uh, this concept is a fantastic concept. And, you know, how great would our society be if we had this ability to um, maybe not fill the prison with people that um, truly don't, you know, don't need to be in prison. They're not awful people. They just made a mistake. I mean, we do have a trial system here in America, but there's not a, a refuge city or anything like that. So it seems like a much simpler process. Right. And then we have this uh, this notation here for Second Samuel chapter 3 with this cat, Abner. And uh, uh, so he goes to the city of refuge and then the avenger of blood, which is a relative of the person he, you know, manslaughtered. Uh, shows up and tricks him into stepping outside of the city. Yeah, he doesn't show up and say, hey, I'm the Avenger I'm the of Blood. Guy. Yeah. <laughs> but he's like, hey, why don't you come over here and we'll chat a while? And they mm. step just outside the city gates and bam, he thrusts them through. So let that be a lesson to you. Be careful when That's you're right. hanging out, when you got an Avenger of Blood on your tail. That's right. Don't go outside the city gate. That'd be our advice. Yep. So then we're going to look at murder versus manslaughter with Yah. Right. So I think let's start with the Genesis 4 thing. Why don't you explain the Genesis 4 So thing? in Genesis 4, this is another example of the law before the law. And so if you've never explored that concept, we encourage you to go check out some examples of how people observed and operated and kept the law before the law existed and was written down. Uh, this is the first ex one of the first examples when Cain goes to a city of refuge, which there's had been no discussion about this, but basically when he gets the mark and he gets sent off to another city, he's protected and, and because he did commit manslaughter and this was a place where he could go safely. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people say, well, he murdered, but we're just looking at what the punishment is. And if Yah is consistent, then the punishment he offers for manslaughter in Torah matches what he gave Cain. <clears throat> so it sounds more like a manslaughter scenario. And we've it, talked about this before a little bit. Yeah, it does. And it kind of makes sense that uh, since they're the first people on the planet, you know, um, it, you know, it's like if you have a child and you have two children and their brothers and sisters, you know, does it actually occur to you that you have to educate them about don't kill each other? You know, it, you know, you just, that's not necessarily a conversation you would typically have with children between a brother and sister. And I think Cain and Abel, y'all didn't have that conversation. It was like, you know, um, you know, I, I, it's like one of those things. He's like, do I really have to explain this? You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, it, it go, it could go into a whole rabbit, a rabbit hole if you wanted it to. Right. But, uh, but I think just simply it was a, you know, innocent deal. He, he was mad. Right. So there's that. 
but but the concept you know you could pick this apart and you could say well he's angry and he committed murder but i think there must be something to it about being manslaughter for him to be sent to the city it just it just makes sense that maybe he didn't understand that uh, he hit him in the head with the rock or whatever he did that it would, could end what did they say it could what um make him unalive <laughs> yeah <laughs> It would unalive him. Yeah. Yeah, because at this point, they hadn't, you know, from from any th recording, you know, the, it doesn't tell us, but I don't think they've seen a dead person at this point. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's slightly speculative, but I think that's an example that kind of shows. Um, and then later on, Yah continuing to keep this, uh, we have Yeshua is the high priest who will never die in the new Jerusalem as a city of refuge. So I think that concept exists there. Um, and so this is, I think that that kind of ties into this discussion. Yeah, yeah, perfectly. Because in the uh, the details of how this worked, you basically could stay in this city until the priest died, and then you're free to go. And the blood of injured does not have legal authority to kill you anymore. Right. So... And by the way, it was kind of a priest for life thing. So, that, you know, that was for a minute. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't like it was four years and you get a new congressman. It wasn't like that. Right. All right. Keeping vows, the us part. Okay. Yes. Once a vow is given, from Numbers 30, it talks about vows. Once a vow is given, you cannot back out on it. And then uh, I have this Judges 11 reference. And this is Jephthah. If you're watching the video portion of this. So, Matt, what happened with Jephthah? Well, it's really like a terrible story. It's a yes. story that everybody hates when you read it. Everybody debates about it. Everybody debates about what it means. And uh, there's different interpretations, and we won't get into that. You, you need to study that out on your own and figure out what you think it means. But he definitely makes this vow, and he was like, the first thing that comes out of my house, I'm going to, you know, sacrifice. Well, provide bur burnt offering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it, burnt offering, and most people believe that, you know, that would be a sacrifice if it's your right. daughter. And his daughter is the first thing that comes out of the house, and he has to fulfill it. And apparently he does, and there is, you know, so anyway, um, it is a yucky, terrible story. And then what does Yeshua say later about the vow thing? He talks about don't make a vow. Yeah. And that's probably this story. He's, you know, he's remembering this story because this, you know, there's moments in human history, I think, that heaven and all the beings up in heaven uh, look down and, and make, or look down or wherever they are um, and see these things. And uh, I'm sure this one, they remember. They're like, that guy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but just, yeah, a terrible story. And it makes sense, I think, um, why Yeshua may tell us uh, later, you know, hey, it's a bad idea to, to do this vow thing. Yeah, and I think, uh, I think, you know, when I read this, my view of it is that this is in here to show us how important a vow is to Yahweh. That, that yeah. when he says you can't back out on a vow, he means it. And, uh, and how important your words are. Right. The words mean things. Right. Yeah. The and you words can't mean just things. say whatever. Yeah. So, and, and a lot of people today in today's world, they just say whatever. Yeah. Social media is full of people that say whatever. I saw, I, I can't tell you, you and I, all of us, we've seen all of these posts on social media where someone will go, look, look at what the government's doing now or whatever it is. And it's like a satire site. Yeah, they have like, <laughs> and you know that it's a satire site, and you're tell, trying to tell people this is real, and, uh, and they're no, like, it's a been, joke. You've been had, Matt. <laughs> yes. uh -huh. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, but, I, I think there's a whatever. lot of people saying a lot of stuff without any proof. Yeah, but so uh, anyway, talking about vows and us keeping the vows, right? And the reason I think that he shows you how important it is is because he has made vows to us. Mm -hmm. And if he's going to say, you know, you can trust me with a vow, then it, him to, 
for him to tell us how important they are to him makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 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 And it's almost uh, like he just kind of allows people to do this vow thing. And it was to teach us how this lesson. And unfortunately for Japheth, this, this is a valuable lesson. The rest of the rest of us learn, I guess. Yeah. And I think it ties into uh, the Nazarite vow because it, uh, that's something that you want uh, you that he uh, requests from certain specific individuals. Um, so he has to have that allotment in there for vows, but he's mm-hmm. like, don't use this incorrectly. Yeah. And so with the vows, there's a yaw part. So what's the yaw part? So yeah, we can trust that the vows that Yahweh has made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and to us will come to fruition because it's his character. His character is you keep your vow, and so he can be trusted to keep his vows. Yeah. And now uh, an example here, I didn't put a verse reference, but uh, in Hebrews, it talks about uh, Yeshua being a surety of the promise to come. And that word surety is talking about essentially a uh, like collateral. Mm-hmm. He's saying, I've given Yeshua, and that is a, a – and – the the spirit as a down payment to show you that I will be I will keep my promise and the full promise will come to fruition and that's just kind of a hold on to this so you know I'll be I'll be back for it yeah 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 good point and then there's building a tabernacle the us part right so in Exodus forty um. Moses builds a tabernacle with all the furniture. Now, um, and we'll get into we'll get into it. So, there's all this stuff that leads up to. I'm thinking how there, you know, the tabernacle comes way before Exodus 40, but it takes till Exodus 40 for them to actually start building it. Because right. there's a lot get, of uh, he gets up the to instructions it. early on. Right. Yeah. So yeah, Moses builds a tabernacle with all the furniture. Um, and honestly, there's some drama, some things that happen along the yeah. way, and then it takes a minute to get to Exodus 40. Right. And build a tabernacle, the Yah part. Yeah, so we got, uh, like I was saying, Exodus 25, uh, and Matt mentioned, so Moses, when he's told to build the tabernacle, he doesn't just, hey, uh, uh, I'll just build a tent. He goes off of a specific thing and it's a model that he was shown in heaven while he's on the mountain yeah yeah and it's kind of an interesting thing too you know we don't we don't know the details of that we don't know if he saw this you know um hologram or something uh, right in front of him and you know or a blueprint or download but uh, he knew exactly what it was supposed to look like because when he comes off the mountain he's able to clearly articulate it and he knows all the details Yes, great detail. Um, and then in Hebrews 8, it talks about that tabernacle as well. And uh, um, let's see. Oh, Sorry, yes. I jumped ahead. No, that's right. And then, um, oh, yeah. And then we hear them talk about the tabernacle in Ezekiel and how the offerings are, are continued in mm-hmm. in the millennial reign. Um, also consider the fact that... Uh, uh, a lot of people will say that, you know, the Melchizedek priesthood started with Adam, right? And mm-hmm, it continues mm-hmm. on uh, through, and you see these people offering sacrifice in specific ways. Well, you, so Yeshua is a high priest, and what does a high priest do, right? He ministers mm-hmm. to Yah, mm-hmm. right? And so, and is a, a, a an intermediary between man and yah and so he's going to be acting in a high priestly fashion and you could say some people believe that that's what he's doing right now as because once he's raised again he's allowed into the holy of holies by the by the fact that his blood is clean Mm -hmm. right and he doesn't need a sacrifice for himself to go into the into the holy of holies he is that perfect he has the perfect blood for it. So, yeah. So, anyway. And he's there intercessing on our behalf. Right. So, think about that. Maybe study that out of, well, if he's a priest, what does that mean? 
uh, you know, use the use the words from the Bible to figure out what priests do, what a high priest's role is, what it means to minister. Yeah, and we're not saying we have all that figured out because you know, there's clearly the Melchizedek connection and and then this and it's something you got to study and yeah, there's research a lot to it. and it's not going to be something that you figure out in just a few minutes yeah this, you, this might take a lifetime yeah this doesn't take reading this takes studying so. yeah yeah <laughs> studying and praying and yeah anyway so build a tabernacle y'all's part yep and then judge righteously us so Jake, I thought we weren't supposed to judge. We're, uh, you know, a lot of people say that, but if you look at our, uh, we actually have a an episode where we discuss this. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I had the name of it, I would tell you, but I don't. Yeah. So there, <laughs> <laughs> it's in the archives. You'll have to watch every episode we it's, did, and then you'll yeah, find it. Speaking of, if you go to sabbathlounge dot com, the shameless plug is happening now. If you go to the menu and you go to the teaching sections, up at the top of that teaching section, there is a handy dandy chart that has different topics and things that we've discussed. And you click there and it will take you right to the section. Right. Very anyway, handy. Back to judging righteously. You mentioned here Exodus 18 and John 7. Yeah. So one thing that I thought about with this is how Moses is set as a judge for all these situations that come up and you know in the torah portion with uh ex that goes along with exodus 18 that's the jethro portion and he's talking about uh he has his father-in-law comes and tells him hey you're putting too much on your shoulders set out you know different judges from the different tribes to judge these matters and obviously they would judge them righteously right um so yeah, they would seek out a matter to make a right ruling on it. So, yeah, and yeah. then uh, John seven essentially uh, is telling us the same thing: seek out a matter and make right, right ruling, judge righteously. And my apologizes, my apologies to the real Jethro. Um, I appreciate you and uh, what you said to Moses, but the name Jethro. Every time I hear Jethro, I picture a guy with a mullet and a rat tail coming out of the woods <laughs> with a banjo, maybe a little tobacco juice between his teeth, and maybe maybe he's got all his teeth. He's like, oh, let me tell you something, Moses. I'll tell you what, I got this figured out. Let me give you some advice right here. Listen closely, Moses. So, so I got that combination, and then... Um, there was something else that uh, was ringing in my head. Oh, he's a righteous dude. I was thinking this is dating myself, but uh, Fairless Bueller's day off with the old secretary lady. And she's like, he's a righteous dude. <laughs> well, so. uh, Jethro uh, may have been a righteous dude. Yes. Yes. So, so anyway. that may have been exactly what he looked like. <laughs> Maybe. We I don't can't know. know. I don't know. All right, so judge righteously, but Yah's version. Right. So uh, Genesis 14 and Hebrews 7, if we look at those, uh, essentially this is going to tell us about Melchizedek, Melchizedek priest. Um, and what that essentially is, is it means my king is righteous or king of righteousness, right? Mm hmm So there, I think. So there, guys. Yeah, there you go. And then we've got some divorce rules, and there's the us part. So what are the divorce rules for us? So uh, in the New Testament, you'll hear, I believe it's, oh, it's Yeshua says, from the beginning it was not so, but because of your hard hearts, you are permitted divorce for adultery. Uh, and that's a, uh, <clears throat> uh, so that's what he says there. But when we look nope, in. Hang on, uh, side note. Yep. I would say. You know, just like a while ago, we were talking about the vows, and and I think the vows, it you know, it doesn't exactly say this. I'm reading between the lines, and this is something you should research. Don't take my word for it. Find find your own opinion about it. But in my humble opinion, I think you can make kind of a comparison between this how he's how this is worded and what he says here about adultery. So yeah, so it's kind of a similar thing, and it kind of fits that same line of thinking. 
Yeah, I you, think with the vows. Yep, you made vows to each other and don't break them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I was thinking even with the thing about vows where he said, um, you know, in the past it was permitted for you to make a vow, but I'm saying to you, you shouldn't make vows. Yeah. So, and and I think that you know, going back to the vow thing, that's not talking about the marriage vow. That's right. not the vow he's talking about. But right. it's the vow of saying this thing is going to happen, and I'm going to do this. Right. So sorry, didn't mean to go backwards on you. No, that's good. Um, So yeah, and then for us, right, if we look in Deuteronomy 24, it says you cannot remarry the woman you divorced. Now, I pulled this specific thing. There's, I mean, there's lots of uh, marriage rules and stuff like that. But this one specifically, because it's very easy to point to a similar um, event with Yah related to it. So, yeah. And I think it's an interesting concept because I don't think that, uh, you know, that concept, it's just permitted. It's not like it was promoted. It w- it wasn't intended. You, you know, the only reason this divorce concept and, you know, Moses gives supposedly Moses gives a certificate of divorce. Um, that is only done because the people's hearts are so hard that they can't make it work kind of thing. And it's kind of a condolence to, but that was not what y'all wanted. He wanted you to be one woman for life. And, um, you know, that, that death do you part literally is, is what his intention. Right. But he kind of made room and made some grace for, for how people live and so we understand that we see that in our world today people sometimes things happen yeah so he made you might call that mercy mercy yes yeah so their divorce rules for yah and you've got jeremiah 3 here right so um it looks like we've got a dual scenario here looks like we duplicated this can't remarry the bride after divorce so death is required now we can remarry the bridegroom. Okay, yes. Oh, it's this one. This one on the left here is the same, I think. No, it isn't. What am I thinking? I'll just read it. From the beginning, it was not so, but because of your hard hearts, you committed adultery. And then Yahweh divorced Israel over that adultery, right? So that's the Jeremiah 3 where he he says, where Yahweh says, and he divorces the northern kingdom. Mm-hmm. And then since he's divorced them, he can't remarry Israel, right? The, the he, he made the rule and yeah. he's going to follow it. Yep. So, and that goes back to the curse of bitter waters. And that's one of the reasons Yeshua has to die on the cross. So the groom has passed away so that he can remarry his bride. Right. And we Legally. understand these are, uh, you know, shadow pictures and stuff like that. But uh, the point is it's, he's represent, he's representative of those parties. Uh, and so, uh, the, the example to us is marriage and the death of the, uh, one of the parties in the, in the marriage in order to, to go on and remarry. And that's an example of the actual thing. So, yeah. And we're hoping as we're going through this presentation that you are seeing a connection between how amazing Yah is that. Uh, he is just the opposite of what we see in the world today. You know, how many politicians have you heard uh, promise something that they didn't deliver? Right. You know, as far as I know, every one of them that has a mouth that right. has said words, they don't <laughs> deliver. And, 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 you know, politicians and just long list of lots of people, unfortunately. Fathers. We, fathers yeah. We sometimes, yeah. And uh, just us as humans, you know, we're not very good at keeping our word and keeping these things. Uh, but Yah keeps his word. He keeps his promises and, and, and he follows his own rules. You know, think about how many people have heard that, you know, that thing like um, do as I do. Or what, do as I say, go? not as I do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so many people. Uh, ha- have trouble with that and but yah does not right he's set the rules for the house and everyone in the house follows him and he is in the house <laughs> he's the father of the house so yeah yeah he's being the example yeah, he's not of, not going beyond of following the rules all right the sabbath in us and you've got exodus 12 here yep very simple he says hey 
rest on the seventh day. Hey, sounds good. Sign me up. I think I'll try it. Okay. Pretty easy. And then the Sabbath, Yah. What does he do? Well, in Genesis 1, it says Yahweh rested on the seventh day. Yeah. And if you look elsewhere, it'll say he rested and was refreshed. Mm-hmm. So, we we what aren't, does that mean? Aren't we all? Yes, exactly. So, if we're to follow Yeshua's example, uh, it makes sense that uh, he's following his father's example, uh, who rested on the seventh day, so that's what we should do. Makes so, sense. if you don't do that, we encourage you to try it. Just, just try it out. See what happens. Yep. Do what Yah does. So this one is a stranger, and this uh, says stranger can join us in the tribe. And so um, this is Jake's favorite uh, Bigfoot, I guess, might, lost in the city. This is my favorite Bigfoot, right? Yes. Yeah, so it talks about uh, the stranger that sojourns among you when it's talking about things like Passover and keeping Passover. Um, the stranger can join you as long as they, they, uh, they as long do as what they, you do. Yeah, as long as they, uh, what do we call that in America? If integrate. They, uh, yes, you have to integrate into society. Yeah. So, uh, and this is all yeah, throughout the say, Old Testament. <laughs> bring the stranger in them and just let them do what they want to do and let them do their cultures. And uh, no, he doesn't say that. Hmm. It almost seems like that would mess up the culture they got going on. Yeah, yeah. He kind of says opposite of that. He says uh, they come in. And if they want to do what you do, that's great. But, um, you know. Um, then they need to do what you do. Yeah. Yeah. If they're going to live with you and stay with you, um, they do what you do. Right. It's what we just talked about. They're coming into the house and there's house rules to the house. So. Yep. Yeah. Good, good, good. Great principle for sure. Yep. So strangers can join the tribe. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yep, so Romans 11 is a good example of this. So it talks about the Gentiles being grafted into the olive tree, the people of the nations. He he uh, prunes off the natural branches and grafts in the wild olive branches. So uh, that's the idea of the Gentiles, the lost sheep, right? And then we also talk about um, uh, the fish, the 53 mm -hmm. fish, 153. 153. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Matt can May, tell you that. Yeah. The Mehai Goahim is yes. what 153 breaks down to, which are like the Gentiles. But, but yeah, this concept of, you know, when you say Gentile, you're, you're really saying the lost people. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, um, it, it's a concept I think that always existed in the, from the beginning, but at this point in, um, the world of when Romans was written, that concept had been gotten lost, and there was very much a we're 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 the chosen people, right. and you're not, right? And and for, quite frankly, that still exists in the world today, yes. still, and in different versions of it. You know, we all divide up in these tribes, this tribalism from from church to you know whatever. Uh, it, it we still do this, right? And, you know, it just may we may have different labels for it. Exactly. But so this is strangers can join Yas tribe. All right. And then the other concept here is don't be a respecter of persons. There's a us piece. Right, so it says, uh, so do not change the judgment of a matter based on someone's wealth or connections. So yes, this Torah principle, um, you can't buy your way out of uh, uh, out of your punishment for committing a crime. Um, you have to pony up, whether and you don't get a harsher crime if you're poor or if you're rich. It's all the same. So Yah doesn't say don't commit murder unless you uh, pay me some. Some uh, Pay me some serious cash. Pay me some doves. Well, and then you see this concept echoed, confirmed in the book of James. In the book of James, he talks about, uh, at least I think it's James, or is it Timothy? So, some One of those talks about don't, don't uh, when the rich person comes into your assembly, 
Don't be like, oh, come up here and have the best seat in the house. You're so and so, um, and you know that they were doing something like that in their assembly. That right. there was definitely a hierarchy um, based upon their wealth or their connections when they came into their assemblies. You know which scripture I'm referring to? I can't think of it off the top of my head. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I don't remember that. Somebody address. put it in the comments if you know the address. Help us out. Yes. We need so, your help. But it's definitely a direct tie-in. So the yah part of this, don't be a respecter of persons. Yeah, so in Acts 10, 34-ish area, we t see how he's talking about, you know, your wealth and your connections are not enough to save you from the judgment to come. So that's why yeah. we all we all have the same uh the same payment to give, and that's uh accept Yeshua yeah and uh, repent and accept Yeshua that's the that's the the payment for avoiding the judgment mm-hmm yeah and you can't avoid it you can't take it with you you know you did it's gonna happen yep just weights and measures the us part right so we got uh, Deuteronomy 25 it talks about using just that using just weights and measures so this is in the in the uh uh concept of cheating people out of uh payment or while you're trading with others because you would measure out you'd if you're gonna go do a deal with someone you'd pull out your scales and you'd weigh out your your bread or your grain or your whatever and then you'd weigh out your gold or silver or whatever you're paying with and then um you would make sure that your gold weighs the correct amount and the weights you'd set the weight on and then that's how much gold you'd put on to pay for your item mm -hmm. and then uh if you had you know if you wanted to cheat someone you'd put a lighter weight on there and then you'd have you would be paying less so, or a uh, a wooden coin coated in gold or something yeah but that would be too light right but some, so that's how you would mess with your weights, tricks. yeah. Yeah. And so he says, don't do that. Yeah, yeah. So the Yah part of just weights and measures is what? So Yah will judge righteously with one standard. And Amen. so, yeah. So his standard is Torah, and have you accepted Messiah? So. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So. Well, I think we're coming to the end here of how Yahweh keeps Torah. So any final thoughts, Jake? How do yeah, you summarize? Just, just that, uh, yeah, we've, we've showed 11 different uh, areas where Yahweh keeps Torah as well. And uh, But I would argue that it's if you look at every command, it's, it's going to have a tie back to Yahweh just because he's spelling out what his character is. And so he's he's like... Well, what can I explain to these people down here? Uh, this is how I act. So this is how they should act. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so. that's good. So uh, put in the comments if you find some other good uh, connections like that. Yeah, maybe something we missed. So, But we appreciate you tuning in. Jake and I don't claim to be Torah experts, do we? No, we, uh, we just study things out and you guys uh, get the... Can we say benefit? <laughs> you guys Maybe. get the opportunity to hear what we're studying on. So Hopefully it helps you, and we encourage you, bottom line, to read the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Be a Berean. Don't take our word for it. Don't take anyone else's word for it. And our hope and prayer for all of you listening, that you would love the commands of Yah and the words of Yah more than the words of man. Because far too many people through time have fallen in love with the words of man and it's led them astray and we pray that uh, you are on a path that takes you uh, in congruence with the words of yah correct all right well we appreciate you stopping by and as always we ask for you to subscribe to like to share to do all the things and uh, this is matt and jake signing out